Welcome. This is our third month in this series of talks. These talks are our way actually of finding meaning of the current issues that confront us in the situation of adversity. We give this as our blessing to the bigger society, blessings of insight, of creativity, and hope and courage. And I'd like to thank the faculty members of the Loyola schools and the professional schools who are participating in the series of talks this month for us. I'd like also to thank the University Research Council and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering for putting together the talks. So again, welcome to Acts of Magis. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure and privilege to introduce to you today a good friend and colleague who I've known and worked with for the past 20 years. Uh, I definitely think that he's a good choice to speak at this forum as Ray Paulo Santiago or RP to those of us who he allows to take advantage of him, that's all of us really, perfectly exemplifies Magis. He has dedicated his professional life to human rights advocacy a lawyer by training, he obtained his bachelor's degree in public administration from the University of the Philippines, his Juris Doctor degree from Ateneo de Manila University School of Law in 2001, and he was admitted to the Philippine Bar the year after. While pursuing his law degree, he joined the Ateneo Human Rights Center as a student intern in 1999, and after graduation, joined AHRC's legal team and manage the programs of the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. At present, he is the Secretary General of the Working Group, as well as the Executive Director of the Ateneo Human Rights Center. The latter position he took on when exigent circumstances required him to step up, and I have to say I can think of no one better to step into the shoes and sit in the chair of the, the great Chochoy Medina, um, than R.P. Santiago. Those who have worked with him can testify to his dedication and passion for the work that AHRC does. As an Ateneo Law faculty stalwart, he handles a number of courses for the law school, and he keeps letting me take advantage by agreeing to teach whatever I ask him to. And he always performs beautifully, of course, and doesn't mind my nagging. He teaches, among other things, constitutional law, international humanitarian law, and, and human rights, of course. He has served as mentor and as advisor to a generation of impressionable young law students. As an alternative lawyer, he leads the Ateneo Human Rights Center in its community building initiatives and projects in the Philippines and abroad, um, such as in the ASEAN region, where we work with a number of institutions. He has taken part in the litigation of landmark cases in the Philippines as well, both as counsel and as petitioner. The more recent cases um, being ones that involved our membership in the International Criminal Court as well as martial law in Mindanao. He has been asked by key institutions, national, regional, as well as international, to give his considered opinions on a host of human rights issues. Most recently, in fact, Three days ago, he was asked by the United Nations to address the UN Human Rights Council during the Council's opening session in Geneva. The panel he was on discussed the Human Rights Report on the Philippines, and RP, as always, did Ateneo and the Philippines proud. His work has been recognized time and again. He was given the Freedom Flame Award of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation in 2014, and ASEAN itself chose him as the ASEAN People's Awardee for the Philippines in 2015. But these things, these are the proverbial bits of icing on the cake. For RP, what has always mattered uh, is embodying the ideals of Ignatian work, of giving and not counting the cost, um, and indeed the communities that he continues to serve are lucky to have him working tirelessly for them and with them. Thank you very much and have a good forum. Good afternoon everyone <clears throat> and welcome to Acts of Magis Athenians in the service of society. My name is Chris Castillo, your moderator. Today's session is uh, quite 
I guess, different in the sense that we have left the virtual gates of uh, Loyola, all right, and have found our way to the gates of the Rockwell campus. No? So we have with us this afternoon one of our very esteemed, yet very humble. I know him, I've, I've known him for quite some time, indeed very humble, uh, yet as the, the introduction had, had mentioned, very well decorated. Attorney R.P. Santiago. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. I am doing well. I could have complain compared to many of our fellow fellow uh, fellow persons here in the field. Yes, sir. Oh, so, so where are you based right now? I'm based in the Greater Manila area, so just mm. right outside Metro Manila. I see. I see. Well, it, it's good to know that you're you're doing well, no? and that uh, thank you for for spending some time with us and and sharing your work. So to the audience, um, before I turn the floor back to Attorney RP, uh, we'd like to request for you to turn your microphones off and also your cameras uh, for the rest of the duration of the program. We are coming to you live via Gmeet, right, where the people in the meeting will post your questions as the talk is happening, and I will pick up these questions later for the Q&A. And for our audience on FB Live, on the Ateneo FB Live, you may also put in some of your questions or comments, and we'll also pick some of those from there and share it with Attorney RP later on. Again, we'd like to thank our, our team who had put together Acts of Magis. In particular, we'd like to thank URC, or the University Research Council, and ARISE, or the Ateneo Research Institute for Science and Engineering. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Attorney R.P. Santiago. The title of my presentation for this afternoon is Access to Justice Under COVID-19. Uh, but definitely, I would like to give a context of access to justice and what has been Ateneo's response to access to justice. And then how has access to justice been exacerbated because of the COVID-19 situation? We will start with what lawyers love to do at first. Okay? We would like to define things. So when we talk about access to justice, and uh, we, uh, we try to define what is justice. So Miriam Webster defines justice as a maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishment. And it uses the word just, okay? So that's the root word of justice. What do we mean by just? Just, as you can see in the encircled words there, just is supposed to be a basis, okay? A basis, it is a standard. It is what is morally upright or good. It is what is merited. It is legally correct, okay? So there must be a standard. So if we talk about the standard, the usual standard that... Uh, people would look to would be the law itself, okay? Do we have a just law? Is justice found in our constitution? Justice definitely is mentioned in our constitution, but it does not just mention justice at all. It actually mentions social justice, okay? Justice is used in the generic sense, but our 1987 constitution emphasizes on the role of social justice. In fact, we have one whole article devoted for social justice and human rights. Okay, what do you mean by social justice and human rights? This is the often quoted phrase of former president, the late president Ramon Magsaysay, when he phrased that, I believe that he who has less in life should have more in law. It sounds very promising. It sounds uh, very romantic. Less in life, more in law. But aren't, isn't that espousing a bit of inequality when you talk about someone having more in law when our sense and vision of justice is a balanced scale? Okay? But let's look at the provision, the first provision of social justice and human rights. The highlighted portions are the ones that I want us to put emphasis on or to concentrate on, okay? Because Section 1 of 
this particular article, Article 13, gives emphasis on what Congress, our lawmaking body, should actually concentrate on. And it should give highest priority to this, okay? In order to ensure that the right of all people is protected to human dignity, okay? Human dignity talks about us as a person, what completes us as a person. The enactment of Congress should reduce social, economic, and political inequalities. So this is what social justice is all about. It talks about there's a lot of inequality in our society today. So we're not just talking about justice. It means that there is actually something wrong with our society that we need to give social justice. Okay? There is a need to reduce the inequalities. And not only the social, economic, and political inequalities, we have to remove cultural inequalities. And one of the ways of doing this is by equitably diffusing wealth and political power. So when we talk about, I'll, probably I'll start with economic inequalities. Economic inequalities, it's very, it's very easy. No? All you need to do is look at those who are actually working in uh, corporate offices, for example. Okay? If you look at the corporate offices, you compare the salaries, for example, of the blue-collar worker from the executive, you would see the economic inequalities there. Okay? Political inequalities, all you need to do is look at our look at who composes our government at the moment. Most of the political power is concentrated on a few political families at this time. In some provinces, there are a lot of political dynasties actually. Okay? But what about social inequalities? When you talk about social inequalities, we look at services, for example, education. Uh, how many how many of those who are disadvantaged, for example, even have the opportunity to be able to study in Ateneo, for example? How many of those who are disadvantaged have access to quality health care? Okay? So these are examples of inequalities that we have at the moment. So if you look at this, okay, it pictures the inequality in terms of economic inequality and social inequality. Okay. So the question now is, how can we access justice? What do you mean by access to justice? Okay. How do we now try to diffuse all those inequality? Okay. When we talk about access to justice, okay, usually people would connote access as physical access. How far is the court? Uh, how do I get to the court? How do, how do I go to government um, institutions? How far is it? Okay. But when we look at access to justice, it's not simply the institution as a whole. We have to look at a process as well, how to access justice. And when we talk about access to justice, it's not about just being able to access what the law says. Sometimes, or actually oftentimes, the problem is the, the law itself. So there must be participation when you talk about justice. Have people's voices been heard? When you craft laws and you look at, again, who are your legislators, who are your policymakers, uh, most of the time they are the elite. Have they been listening to the people? Okay? This is what you call as uh, their top-down approach. They think... They think they would know what is best for the people, but they also need to consult. Have the people been able to exercise their rights? Now, very basic, if we go to our constitution, okay, there are a lot of uh, rights scattered in the constitution, but basically you have the Bill of Rights and you have social justice and human rights. Okay? And the people should be able to challenge discriminatory policies and practices, and there must be accountability, okay? accountability for policy and decision makers. In short, there must be a fair, transparent, effective, non-discriminatory 
and accountable services. Okay? So that's the concept of access to justice. Now, I tell you this would be the a few of the last of all these uh, uh, definitions. Okay, But when we talk about the rule of law, because most of the time you would hear people say, but that is what the law says. No, that is what the law says. And then recently we all we, we will hear people saying dura lex sed lex. Okay? A Latin phrase which says the law may be harsh, but that is the law. Okay. So what do we mean by rule of law? Okay. Well, basically rule of law means that we have to be governed by the law. But there are also instances when the law is actually used as a tool in order to commit injustices. So if you say, well, let's follow the law, but the law is actually the tool for injustice, is that a just law? Is there proper access to justice? So what do we really mean by rule of law? The law is there as a tool in order to en enhance that principle of governance. Okay? We always hear the term, we should have good governance in government. So what do we mean by governance, good governance, whether it be corporate governance, whether it be uh, state governance? Governance simply means that there is accountability. Okay? There is accountability. The law is clear. It is not a secret. It is publicly pro promulgated. And there is no bias with the law. It is equally enforced and independently adjudicated. But what we should emphasize is that it must be consistent with international human rights norms and standards. Okay? Why is this so? Okay? And uh, I pointed out that this is the definition, the working definition of the UN, the United Nations, on the term rule of law. Why is it consistent? Why should it be consistent with international human rights norms and standards? Okay? Because international human rights norms and standards look at the rights of individuals, peoples, and groups. This is, in a way, the baseline. Okay? The baseline of what are we entitled to. So if you are now a decision maker and you would like to have proper governance, okay, the term that is usually being used right now is the bottoms-up approach. You go to the bottom, you find out what is it needed there at the bottom. Okay, What rights of them are actually not being exercised? What has to be protected? And then you legislate or you create policies in order people, in order for people to be able to exercise their entitlements, their rights. Okay? So this rule of law must be governed by the principles of supremacy of the law, okay? equality before the law. So when we say equality, again, it does not choose to whom shall it be applied and not applied against. There must be accountability okay, of all people subject of the law, and there must be fairness, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certain certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, procedural and legal transparency. So in short, it's a big responsibility in crafting laws and policies. No? There is a whole standard for us to say that it is to be a just law. Okay. Now, let's look at our environment. Okay, These are editorial cartoons of the social injustices that we see at the moment. Okay. So, for example, we, we see the very uh, little budget okay, um, that, it, that the health sector is getting despite more tax collection from the SIN tax. We also see, again, peasants caught in between the military, which is the government, and the rebel forces. Okay? And they are caught in between. Okay? Usually, uh, the peasants are being described either by the rebels as, you know, they are uh, supporting government, or at times the government, the security forces will uh, 
will uh, suspect that they are actually rebels or rebel supporters. Okay? We have political dynasties okay? and unfair treatment even between the rich and the poor with regard to our justice system. Okay? So these are some of the social injustices that we see. Okay? More recently, we also see all of these headlines. Okay? A teacher arrested over a tweet, okay? uh, charged in court for inciting to sedition, but this teacher was arrested without any warrant of arrest. Okay? No warrant no warrant of arrest. Okay? Uh, right next to it, actually, it's the same person, but the judge now junks the sedition case uh, against the teacher. Uh, people will always say, oh, see, that person was actually uh, released. No? But the fact remains that the person was unnecessarily incarcerated for a number of days simply because the proper procedure to file a case against that person was not followed. Okay? So you see uh, the law being used in order to suppress okay, legitimate dissent. What about access to justice? I, I like to point this out. No? This, part, this is a particular case of lawyers who were actually detained for doing their job. Okay? This happened uh, two years ago in Makati City. Okay? One of the bars in Makati City was raided by the police. Okay? They had a search warrant. So the, war the, the raid and the search is very lawful. Okay? So when the police arrived, the bar owner now contacted his lawyers. Three lawyers came, and lawyers, being lawyers doing their job, okay, they were actually asking what the police were doing. Uh, they were asking what type of evidence that the police were taking. Okay? Lo and behold, the, the police officers got annoyed with the three lawyers and decided to just arrest them. Okay, arrest, uh, They arrested them for obstruction of justice. They actually still filed a case. Uh, I, I forget the technical name of the case against the lawyers, but particularly they involved those three lawyers for uh, the control of the alleged illegal drugs within that bar. Okay, Because that bar is being said to allow uh, the use and pro proliferation of the illegal drugs. These are already lawyers. That's why I wanted to point them out. Okay, Lawyers who are supposed to be able to, in a way, theoretically defend themselves. Okay, So those lawyers were later on detained, and uh, the pro proper procedure for that is that they will be put into an inquest proceeding. A prosecutor would determine whether there is probable cause to file an information, which is the formal complaint, in court. Okay, so a few hours after, uh, in fact, they were detained overnight. The prosecutor decided not not to have not to immediately file an information in court, but allowed the release of the lawyers. Okay, pending a formal preliminary investigation. Okay. And then uh, Senator Laxon said, well, let's also get the cops side of the story. Okay. But okay, uh, months after, the case against the three lawyers were, uh, were um, junked by the court. Okay? They were junked by the court. Okay. Why am I pointing this? Because it was junked by the court because the court ruled that the arrest of the lawyers were actually unlawful. Okay? It was not within the bounds of the law. And most of the time, you would, uh, you would ask or people would say, ah, so the state forces made a mistake and they were excessive with what they did. Shouldn't the lawyers now file a case against these police officers? You know, that would normally what other people would say. Do you think that the lawyers actually filed any case against the police officers who unlawfully 
incarcerated them even for just a few hours. No? And if you ask me, I can tell you that they were actually released by the prosecutors simply because they were lawyers. If they had not been lawyers, they would have stayed longer in uh, in, in, in in jail. Okay? They did not. They did not file any charges against um, against the police officers. Okay? They did not. The reason, they don't want any backlash anymore. So imagine, this is what you call justice for lawyers who are already trained to tussle with uh, police officers, with government officials for excesses, and yet they choose not to exact accountability. Okay? Multiply that situation okay? hundred and thousand fold okay? with the situation that's happening at the moment. So that is a picture of access to justice. How does Ateneo respond to injustices? My presentation is about a collective work that we do with Ateneo Human Rights Center. So Ateneo Human Rights Center is a unit of the law school of the university. Okay? The center was founded right after the 1986 EDSA revolution when there were so many reforms, uh, possible reforms that uh, could happen because of the downfall of a dictatorship. Okay? So it was one of the first university-based institutions and our vision is to have a just and humane society. Very straightforward. Our mission is to respect, protect, and promote human rights. And these are our objectives. We want to form and sustain more human rights lawyers and advocates in the Philippines. Okay? We want to have more alternative lawyers. And actually, the term alternative should be dispensed with because when you talk about fighting for rights, this should be done by all lawyers. Okay? So all lawyers should actually be human rights lawyers. We want to make justice more accessible to victims. We monitor and advocate compliance for human rights laws and instruments. And we move towards the empowerment of civil society, towards peace, democracy, gender equality, good governance, and the rule of law. Okay? And I want to emphasize here the role of empowerment. Because when you talk about social justice, when you talk about access to justice, the first step towards empowerment is learning the law, okay? knowing what the law provides. We have several desks, so this is how we do our work. We have our flagship program, which is our internship program, uh, wherein we form the minds the heart of law students. And we target not only Ateneo de Manila law students. Right now, I will share with you later on our COVID response to the internship. Ongoing, we have students coming from uh, St. Louis University College of Law from Baguio. We have uh, students from University of Cebu. We have students from Ateneo de Naga University. Uh, we also have students from Xavier University. Okay? So in the past, we have also accommodated students coming from Palawan State University, uh, University of uh, St. Lasal, Bacolod, okay? uh, University of Nueva Cáceres, uh, and many other universities all over the Philippines. So in this internship program, we make them, we make our interns feel poverty firsthand because it is different to be able to serve from the perspective of those who have really very less in life. We usually have our immersion for one whole week uh, in an indigenous people's community. Okay, And usually they would only be assigned Two, not more than three persons per community, deprived of their gadgets. And I al I'm always proud to say only with 50 pesos in their pocket. Okay? But we uh, provide them with the necessary food and provisions. We have a child rights desk. Adikain para sa karapatang pambata. 
advocacy. So we do uh, child rights advocacies both formally and informally. We cater to children themselves and we also cater to policymakers who craft, who make policies that affect children. We also do our work both in the Philippines and within the Southeast Asian region, ASEAN. We also have a desk on women and migrant workers, our gender desk, which has been very much involved in training of uh, many different government agencies and even some offices within Ateneo, to name a few. Okay. And we are also the Secretariat of the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. It is our regional advocacy in Southeast Asia. I am proud to say that Ateneo has been at the forefront of human rights institution building within ASEAN. We have been meeting with uh, different government uh, agencies, particularly ministries of foreign affairs of all 10 ASEAN member states. Okay. So what do we do? We do training and education, both formal and informal. We do it in the classroom. We do it in uh, barangay halls. And at times, we do it outside in the streets with communities okay, or in the mountains. We do a lot of law and policy advocacy and, re and reform. As I mentioned earlier, at times, the problem is the law itself. So we work a lot in order to improve the law. Okay? Our, um, sometimes our mentality is that instead of you know, trying to help 10 to 20 persons who would come to us because they felt that there is an injustice with the law, okay? we try to uh, see how we can work with our government institutions in order to address any possible injustice in the law. Okay? We do research and publications uh, since we are also part of an academic institution. Uh, research is also ingrained in the work that we do. We also do public interest litigation. So earlier, my partner in crime, uh, Maita, uh, Dean Maita of the Ateneo Law School, mentioned some of the cases that the center has been involved with. Okay? So we take on impact cases that, uh, that would have uh, definitely uh, change society if we're able to contest uh, laws or policies that uh, might not be just to certain sectors of our, our society. And we do a lot of uh, curriculum development. We also help law schools. We help uh, different agencies in crafting programs and modules for empowerment. Okay, So I'll just show you some of the photos that uh, we try to do. I know that there has been for example, this is during the uh, burial of uh, the late strongman Marcos in, at Pilibingan ng Mga Bayani. Uh, there was a mass action that happened in Loyola. Well, hindi kami magpapahuli sa Rockwell. You see the guards there, though? The, at first, the guards were not allowing us to go out of the Rockwell uh, campus. No? Uh, they wanted us just to have our own vigil inside the campus itself okay so what we did we we said well well we'll just walk no there's nothing wrong with walking except that we were also uh carrying some candles and uh, signs no but we wanted to show our indignation so this is part of again uh and by the way this was actually led by the students themselves they, they just asked help from the Ateneo Human Rights Center to ensure that they will not be dispersed by the guards. Okay? Uh, this is us at the law school meeting with university professors from Myanmar, actually discussing our programs both at the law school, the formal education, and the informal human rights education that we do outside of the law school. Okay? And I also want to point out, and this was way back in 2016, where our law students, the law students themselves, submitted a report on the killings to the United Nations. So they themselves uh, researched, 
looked at the legal arguments and they they were the ones who submitted it to the UN Human Rights Council way back in 2016. Okay. Right now, we are also helping even local government units. For example, you may have heard of the Dinagat Islands. The Dinagat Islands are in uh, Mindanao. Its gateway is Surigao City. The government there is an alumnus of the university, uh, Governor Kaka Bagao, Bagao, incidentally, who is uh, she celebrating her birthday today. No? Uh, but it was diffi- a difficult journey for her because the province was actually controlled by a very strong political family. But anyway, the province is a fourth class province. And uh, it's really quite poor. Okay, so we are helping the province. Uh, we have a common vision of empowering the citizens, uh, the constituents, constituents of that province. Okay, so our way of empowering them is to knowledge of the law and helping them establish the institutions, uh, the legal institutions there in the province. Because right now. You know, if there is a legal problem in in the province, they only have a municipal circuit trial court. Okay? They have two municipal circuit trial courts, but it's only only one has been only one judge has been appointed. So that judge would have to go all around the province, okay, uh, once a month because his base actually is in Surigao City. But if there are higher crimes that happens, let's say for example if there is a sexual abuse that happened in the Dinagat Islands. Do you know where they would have to file the complaint? They would have to take a ferry and go to Surigao City. There is no such institution within the Dinagat Islands. Okay? So this is part of the legal empowerment that we do for access to justice. Okay? So these are examples of the activities that we did there in the community. Actually, earlier I was mentioning that... Uh, part of our flagship program to form more human rights lawyers and advocates is our internship program. Uh, We had a convergence of um, programs actually last January. We were able to bring in uh, at least 35 law students coming from all over the Philippines. As I mentioned earlier, we all brought them to the Dinagat Islands in order for them to do paralegal trainings, to to do their immersion, to help the barangays in crafting ordinances, to help the barangay officials in uh, learning more of the law. And then we also conducted uh, legal aid consultations in uh, the Dinagat Islands because many of them really don't know what their rights are. Many of them have lots of questions about law. Okay? So that is part of the engagement towards empowerment of communities. Okay. But COVID-19 has affected many of our programs and uh, we, we had to recalibrate right now. Okay, So right now, for example, we have restrictions for travel. Uh, Actually, sa totoo lang, kating-kate yung mga ibang lawyers at the Human Rights Center to go to the Dinagat Islands no? because uh, the people there have already been uh, you know, very close to us okay? because of the in- continuous engagement that we have been doing. Okay? But the university, for example, has a prohibition for travel uh, regardless whether it is domestic or international for the rest of the year. So we had to rethink how can we do our work so this is an example of how we're coping okay? by doing policy paper, policy papers, okay? uh, particularly to convince um, later on the Supreme Court to relocate one of the courts to the Dinagat Islands. We're going to be will will train the staff of the provincial legal office to be able to do the work that we have been doing before. Okay. And then we'll be doing some training of trainers among uh, barangay officials to become resource persons. We'll try to see how we can have a combined 
community forum wherein people are present and we'll, we'll see how we can be virtually present as well. Okay, but uh, technology, there are technical problems as well in, in the province. Okay, and how we can continue with providing for legal aid services to the people of uh, Dinagat Islands. Even our alternative internship program is challenged. We have to be able to hone the hearts and minds of law students. So we were also asking, how can we approximate the values that we have, the values that we have identified, that the values that, uh, you know, we, we, we saw as very important in the internship program itself. But how can we do that virtually? Okay, so we had to plan out and had uh, discussions and even uh, many of these discussions are with law students because we wanted to, you know, go back to what, what uh, changed their hearts and minds, what opened their minds to the situation. How can we approximate such kind of feeling? Okay. okay. Now for children's rights, uh, we have this project Kamustahan Among Children. We're doing this online as well. Uh, in the project Kamustahan, we recognize that because of the quarantine, you know, there, is, there has been a surge as well of domestic violence and abuse among women and children. Okay? So this is one advocacy that we are currently doing together with uh, Save the Children. Uh, aside from being able to draft policy papers for our uh, policy makers, and these policy makers would be consultative, getting inputs from children, we also want to make sure that we will be able to provide safe spaces to children. Okay? So how do we do that? Uh, we're able to document as even through technology, Okay, and uh, get referrals of child rights violations. So if we get reports, okay, we are able to use our network of government partners. Okay, we're able to tap advocates and respond accordingly. Okay, uh, but naturally, you know, because of the situation, there are also some delays. So we are also trying to do the best that we can with the situation right now. Okay, So definitely, I, I say that access to justice has been uh, made difficult because of the situation right now. Okay? Yeah, we also have briefers for children. Okay, So we, we have uh, this, for example, to talk about current issues to be able to... Uh, connect with children through the platform. Okay. And then, um, these FAQs actually are FAQs that we developed for the public. When uh, the quarantine happened, we were wondering, at first we were wondering, is there a role for lawyers right now during the quarantine when the frontliners most have been the medical frontliners, what would be the role of lawyers of the legal community? And then later on, we saw that, you know, there were so many arrests. People were asking about, um, they were trying to get information. Okay, So what did we do? We now used social media platform and created an online okay, legal assistance. Okay, online legal assistance. Part of what we did are a series of frequently asked questions, okay? So FAQs at the time, at the height of the ECQ, okay? FAQs to talk about women's rights, okay? How do we protect women's rights? How do we prevent abuses from happening for women? If there are abuses, where can they run to? What are their rights, okay? We talked about freedom of speech and expression, Especially at a time when there were, you know, there were threats that if you complain too much on social media, you no, know, then you might be arrested, okay, for your plight, for what what you're complaining of, 
Okay, so we had to talk about what what does the law provide? Okay, and even the power of the NBI. We also catered to rights of health workers because we found out that many health workers had been discriminated because of the COVID nineteen situation. Quite ironic, no? They are seen as our heroes, but at the same time, there are segments of the community which has discriminated uh, our frontliners. We talked about the labor rights because many laborers, many people, actually were not getting salaries anymore or wages. Okay? No work, no pay. Okay? And some about self-care because uh, we also believe, although our background is mostly legal, mental health is also very important at this time. Okay? We came out with statements in order to just ensure to put a check on what we think could be excesses by government. Okay? So statement on the emergency powers, a statement on uh, freedom of expression and speech. Okay? And then as I mentioned, we also had our online legal assistance program, okay? which is still ongoing up to now. So right now, if you visit the AHRC online legal assistance uh, counseling page, okay, uh, you can private message your concern. Okay? And uh, we, we give information, we give referrals. At times, we also handle the cases when we feel that kawawa naman masyado, ilumalapit. So even in the house, okay, this is one of my, uh, I'm about to end, no, but this is one picture just to show that even in the house, not only are we having meetings, not only are we trying to reach out to ensure that uh, we can have access to justice, we also provide legal services even at times from the comfort of our homes. So this is me preparing for a hearing, okay, and there you see in the next screen, the, the hearing, okay, uh, it was an online hearing that happened, okay, uh, so that is the uh, concept, okay, well, that's really my attire, no, it's, I'm proud to say that I am able to wear barong shorts and slippers in a hearing, okay? and uh, as Maita mentioned, part of the work that we do at the Ateneo Human Rights Center is also to bring in international solidarity, again, to help the Philippines cope with its human rights challenges. So I will end with that. I hope that uh, it give, gave you a glimpse of what has been Ateneo's response to many of uh, these challenges. Okay. Thank you very much, Attorney RP. Uh, at this point, typically, if we were live, you'd be receiving much applause from our audience. Uh, but for now, we'll offer you Acts of Magic Hearts. I hope you can see the, the Korean hearts I'm, I'm putting up. These are for you. Thank you for, for the sharing. And again, for, for our audience here on, on the G chat, you know, uh, if you have questions, please post them uh, on the chat column and we'll pick up some of them. To our audience on Ateneo FD Live, you may also put in your comments and questions and we'll pick up some of them as well. But we, we already got a few earlier and um, maybe let, let's start with, with this one. Uh, I think it, it's, a cons it's a, I'm not sure if it's a misconception and perhaps that's why it was asked, no? but based on your stories, there seems to be some element of danger, no? a, a real practical danger to human rights work, right? Is it? Is, there, is human rights work dangerous, Attorney RP? Okay. Uh, you know, there, there, are, there had been some lawyers who had also been targeted, Chris, no? And uh, okay. human rights workers, okay? Now, the danger um, has been present because of threats from some sectors of our society, even trolls at times, uh, even based on opinion and stand of people. And whatever threat is given, okay, uh, it should be taken seriously because we actually don't know um, what is the background of these people who are giving threats. No? But how we protect ourselves is that, one, we ensure that the work that we do 
is not politically motivated. Okay? We take a stand on issues that are close to us. And uh, I always engage uh, friends from whatever political affiliations they may be and really challenge people and say, you know, this has, has been consistent positions taken by Ateneo Human Rights Center ever since. So we are not being swayed by, uh, you know, who is the leader? Are we against that leader? You know, we, we have our personal opinion on, on those things. Okay? But ultimately, the work that we do, we, we can look people in the eye and say, we don't engage in partisan politics. Okay, so in that, um, then we are able to engage both government and non-government workers. So at least from from our part, we feel safe that you know the people from government actually know the nature of the work that we do. They actually, you'll be surprised. They understand, and they will not say it publicly, but they will they will act. They actually support many of the things that we do simply because they cannot do it from within. So that is how we support reform efforts okay, within the government. Thank you, Attorney RP. Um, next thing probably, no, uh, we, 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 I know up in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be having the, some sort of a graduation ceremony for our Batch 2020 from, from Matineo Law School. Right. Uh, I think two Sundays from now, there will be some ceremony for them. And of course, uh, as newly minted lawyers, you know, they, they have aspirations and dreams. But maybe to the parents who are listening to this talk, you know, and then even to those who are aspiring to be lawyers and are just starting their journey, is it profitable all right, to be a human rights lawyer? Typically, the picture of a lawyer is in their uh, suit and their barong, whether in shorts or long pants. Okay, no, but as a human rights lawyer, definitely the work is very, very uh, substantial you know, and then very relevant. But is it profitable, attorney, attorney RP? Okay, ang um, usual answer to Jed Chris is hindi ka magugutom, no? Mm-hmm. Hindi ka magugutom, and I think uh, it's a matter of perspective of what is important to one's life, no? Because at times, you look at different priorities of different people. Like, for example, if I look at my classmates, some uh, also uh, married early. You know? Some actually are still unmarried, have put career in for, at, uh, as part of what they want really to do. And, and for me, it's a matter of priority. What, what, what is important to you? Okay. So if now... What is important to you, for example, really are material possessions. Probably human rights work might not be for you, okay? Or probably you might want to amass uh, more resources now and then later on go into human rights work when uh, you are very much established, okay? But from many friends who have engaged into human rights work early on, all I can say is that, you know, we, we don't go hungry. Uh, I think there is a spiritual aspect to that as well that God also provides. You know? And uh, for us, when you talk about profit, profit does not come only in the sense of monetary benefits. Okay? Profit is many things. One for me is experience of being able to mingle with uh, different sectors of our society. And I've learned a lot. You know? I have something to share definitely I've learned a lot of life lessons from them. Okay? Number two, it opens up a lot of different opportunities as well. Okay? So opportunities, for example, one of the things uh, that opened up for me is opportunity to be able to travel too. No? Although at times, nakakapagod yung travel then because uh, short you meetings. Uh, but, but, you know, it's a good perspective of to be able to see Nice places becomes aspirational that you would like these things to also happen in the Philippines. No? So, hindi yung tipong hindi ganito sa yung commercial before, di ba? Na walang ganyan sa states. No? Parang sa akin, no, the good that we see there, that is possible here in the Philippines. 
how can we work towards that? No, it becomes aspirational that uh, we can do it as a people. So these are some examples of, for me, uh, in a way, these are the treasures that I got from my human rights advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Arty, for clarifying that. And I'm happy and I'm thankful at the same time no, that uh, there are a lot of consolations. No? Maybe in, in terms of, of our jargon in Ignatian spirituality, consolations come in many forms, some in more tangible, monetary perhaps, but also in other in other fruitful ways. Uh-oh. Chris, I would also want to add, siguro yes, I'm able to do this in, in dito right now, ang pala ko actually our family. <laughs> I really won't be able to do the kind of work that I am doing if also not for the support of family members. No? They keep us going. And ultimately, um, you know, I think many of us do our work for our family. No? So this is the, the inspiration that I get also from family. As well as for, for many of us, I'm, I'm sure. No? But thank you very much for pointing that out, Attorney. Uh, in relation to family, no, and uh, you mentioned this uh, a while ago as well, uh, you have a lot of human rights lawyers who are doing this work. No? Kumusta naman po sila? No? I mean, on an emotional level also, the, I, I could imagine the stress you guys also experience. No? But uh, how, how do you cope, I guess, with the, the stressful work that you do as well? Kumusta kayo being hum- bilang human rights lawyers? Okay. We cope... Uh simply because parang ano yan eh, it's like being in a community of like-minded and like-hearted persons. Diba? You share each other's passion. You are able to throw ideas to each other. Debate on many issues. Uh, hindi naman parate, nagkakasundo kayo. Uh, kanya-kanyang tempering of passions din. Merong very passionate na uh, go-go-go. Diba? Merong medyo conservative. Okay? But ultimately, uh, I, I think we cope simply because um, we, we also try to balance things. Uh, doing human rights work and at times when you are dealing with um, people who are really less fortunate, it could also be draining. No? So I, I think we are able to draw strength not only from family members, but get inspiration from within uh, AHRC, within the law school community, within the university, within the networks that we have. So that that's how we are able to cope. And um, during the pandemic right now, once in a while, we, we will have our quiz night sessions virtually, no, para masaya lang, masaya rin, no, kasi with um, the work actually that's happening right now, uh, the technology some, somehow work never stops. In fact, in the legal counseling page that I mentioned that I shared right now in the chat box, at times, madaling araw, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, minsan eh, merong mga humihingi ng tulong. <laughs> no, they need advice and sometimes it's immediate. Okay? So we also need to balance those things. Okay, th- thank you for pointing that out. No? Um, I, I, I could just imagine, again, you know, the, the kind of uh, challenges you guys face. And uh, we wish you well. We wish the team of uh, HRC well. You know. But tell me, uh, before, as, before we wrap up, if, if there are people watching right now uh, in the chat on FB and those that will eventually get to see this, how can we support the advocacy that you do? How can we support the work that you do? Mm-mm. Uh, by the way, Chris, I forget. I forgot to mention nung off stage tayo nung before we were online. Yeah. I kept on saying, please just call me RP. No, especially RP. Act- oh, actually, I I always tell people that I mingle with, uh, even in communities, uh, RP lang po, because at times part of using the title, no, mahilig tayo yung mga Filipino sa title. That's part mm. of the uh, barriers to access minsan eh. Nahihiya kasi parang, uy, abogado yung kausap ko. Yung may maganyang mentality that shouldn't be. No? It shouldn't be a barrier. True, true. Okay. So, but in terms of support, uh, actually, for, for me, 
we could always start with just talking about issues. We don't need to agree on issues. Okay? It's nice that we talk about issues <laughs> with mutual respect. That mm-hmm. is actually what's always important. Okay, And then, if we feel passionate about certain things, then I think we can do by, uh, you know, uh, being able to share it with our immediate networks, our friends, you know, bring awareness. Okay? And at this time, uh, this is not legal. Uh, I mean, this is not related to anything about the law. But at this time, for those who can afford, actually, now is also the time to be generous. Yung mag-tip ka ng konti or yes. huwag na tayo mainis dun sa na- nanlilimus ngayon because mm. many people are really in need at the moment. So for me, simple acts of charity and kindness goes a long way. And uh, again, I said um, what galvanizes uh, the strength is always within our immediate family. So these things, how do we now bring it outside Okay. Thank you very much, RP. All right. And uh, well, and any final message that you'd like to share with our audience? I think I've said too much, Chris. I just want to thank <laughs> everyone who stay tuned, uh, especially my family and friends, uh, family from um, Alentahan side, especially, and uh, from even my high school classmates, those from Ateneo Human Rights Center, both uh, staff, lawyers, and uh, the alumni of AHRC mm. and of course everyone else who are listening you know, uh, who's listening so I do hope that uh, with uh, this simple things that we have been doing it will also encourage people to uh, do their own advocacy okay, for others so maraming salamat for this platform and opportunity to be able to share it was our pleasure to, to feature you and your work uh, RP now and uh, speaking of, of thanks, uh, we'd like to thank you, our audience, for, for being with us this, uh, this Friday afternoon. And uh, we have started July. Now, this is July, and it's Ignatian Month. And probably more than how it has been the past months, no, let, let's feel the spirit of Father Ignatius with us, and let's keep in our prayers each other. We pray for the HRC people and, and the work that they do. We pray for our students who are about to start their, their online journeys, right? And let's pray for each other, those who try their best to guide all our students, our community, uh, through this difficult time. But God's graces are upon us, and uh, I'm sure St. Ignatius is smiling upon us as well. So with that, we'd like to thank you for joining us. The talk and the previous talks are available at artium.ateneo.edu, should you want to review them. And we'll see you again next week. This is Acts of Magis Ateneans in the Services of Society. This is Chris Castillo. Thank you and God bless you.